Hi, I'm Brett Dillon, and today I'd like to talk to you about developing characters for stories, whether for film or stage, or perhaps a story of some kind in a novel or some other fictional short story. I've been a writer for a great part of my life, and it all started off when I was in, in high school. And, but I've been a storyteller for even longer, even as a child I've been a storyteller. So here's some things that I've learned, some tips. And I'm going to kind of follow this roadmap. We're going to talk about the importance of character development to the story itself. And then we're going to discuss the, the importance of conflict to the story. And then how to develop characters through the context of the characters' lives and their backgrounds and things like that. And in addition to that, within the context of the conflict. So the importance of character development. Characters are going to connect audiences to the story. That's what characters do. And so there's this triangle of, of audience and story and storyteller. And the characters form the connections between those three points on the triangle. Now the importance of conflict. Conflict creates the tension that attracts people to this plot. So if you have a, a plot that has no conflict, Nobody cares. Nobody's interested in that. You know, nobody wants to see, um, and well, generally nobody wants to see, although I understand there's some things happening where you can watch people cruising down the fjords of Norway and it's incredibly boring, or you can watch people knit for hours and hours and hours and hours, which I could do all by myself because that's what my wife does without ever having, there's no conflict there. Now the conflict happens when I get upset that she's spending so much time knitting instead of doing other things. So that conflict creates the tension and the tension is what creates the attraction for the audience to the plot. And, and if you don't have any of that conflict, you don't have any of that tension, then you end up with a, something that's, that's very, very boring and nobody wants to see it. Nobody wants to read it. Nobody's interested in things that don't have some kind of conflict. And now the conflict can either be internal or external to the characters. So the elements of a great story are sort of the recipe or the, the, the equation to come up with a great story is first you develop these great characters that are fully fleshed out. And then you put these characters in some kind of a predicament. And then you tell the story of how they attempt to extricate themselves from this predicament. So that's going to give you a great story, something that, is, that people are attracted to, something that people are interested in, something that is worthwhile. If they're going to invest the most precious resource they have, their time, you should at least make it worth their while. So when we talk about developing the characters, those rich characters that you need to get people interested in connecting between the story and the storyteller, let's talk about the context of the characters because we're interested in characters, not caricatures. So we want to make sure that they're complex, not shallow. Nobody likes shallow characters, whether in real life, you know, nobody likes the shallow people wandering around this world in, in condition white. We prefer people that are complex, people that, that are interesting. Uh, shallow people are very boring. You look at them and there they are. Nothing else to them. You scratch them. That's all they got. There's, there's nothing. There's no deeper elements. There's no deeper anything to them. They're very boring. Nobody's interested in shallow people. And they're not interested in shallow characters in your stories either. So let's first talk about the demographics. So the demographics are going to cover things like their gender. And then within the gender types, you want to have them placed on some range in the scale of, of femininity to masculinity. Somewhere in there, um, within each gender type, they'll be playing on that scale. And you want to describe their age and, and, and be explicit. And you know, don't just say old. How old? Um, because People that are of, of specific ages will behave certain ways, or they're more likely to behave certain ways, but you can also create some tension in their life by having an old person who doesn't behave like an old person. You know, the grandmother that does cartwheels, for example, which my grandmother never did, but it would be funny as hell if she had. You can get into things like their education, um, because depending on, on how educated they are, and I don't mean necessarily um, their school-based education, although that is important, but the world is your university, so you really should be looking at, at education beyond the boundaries of university or college grounds. And, and how well educated are they? How well, can they um, how well can they speak? How well can they articulate their thoughts? 
Um, how deeply do they think and, and consider things? So all of that is going to come into play to, into them having an educated mind. And then what is their geographic location? Where did they grow up? Where did they spend their formative years? Uh, that has an impact on, on their development as, as a character. Where are they now? will have an impact on that. And then what's their family background? What kind of background did they have growing up? What's their current family situation? Are they married? Are they single? Um, are they happily married or happily single? Um, might be a, a better way to phrase that. Uh, what's their occupation? What do they do in exchange for money? Um, what, what kind of value are they generating to society through the work that they do? Are they creators or are they just order takers? Are they, what are they doing in, in, in their daily life that brings them worth and, and gives them value to society. And then let's take a look at their socioeconomic status. Um, that's going to be a, a critical thing to look at. And then the time period that they're living in. You know, is this a story set in the Civil War? Well, the characters are going to think and behave differently than if it's set in modern times. Um, if this was set in the Middle Ages, they would definitely be behaving differently than they would behave in the Civil War period. And, and after we've looked at, at their demographics, you know, the sort of physical descriptors of the character, we want to look at their psychographics because, again, you're developing characters, not caricatures. You're, you're developing complex people. They're not complicated. Don't make them complicated, but it's okay to make them complex. And there's a big difference between complicated and complex. So you want to describe their temperament. Um, are they short-tempered? Are they, are they slow to anger? Are they, you know, what... How do they react or, or do they respond instead of react? You know, what kind of temperament do they have? What are their values, their beliefs, and their convictions? What are the key past events that have occurred that have shaped their lives, that have turned them into the person that they are by the choices that they made in response to those or their reaction to those, those events? And then what past successes or failures have they had that have brought them to this point in their life? Uh, what kind of fears and phobias do they have? That, that can be incredibly important to the, to the storyline. For example, if, in, in, if you think of the movie Arachnophobia, um, having a fear of spiders was a big thing. Um, and then, of course, you can go through a, an entire list of phobias. Um, agoraphobia would be an interesting, uh, an interesting phobia for a character to have when they can't go outside, but they're observing the world through their lens of their windows. And so that's all they see of the world is what's out there and what they get to see on the internet, what they get to see on their television set. You know, so that would have a different impact on that character and how they respond and react to, to different conflicts in their life. And what kind of quirks do they have? Every, every human being on the planet has, has little things that make them unique, that make them different, little quirky things. Um, everybody's got them. So your character should have them too. A character without quirks isn't quite human. And so we like things that are more like us. So if you're going to be developing a character, make sure you develop a character that also has the quirks that make people people. And what kind of talents and skills do they have? What are, their, what are the things they're good at? And, and that's going to have an impact on how they respond and react and what their capabilities are as a character to deal with certain conflicts. So that brings me to the conflict part. So when you're developing characters, you have to understand that, that conflicts are going to change the characters. It's going to cause that character to undergo some kind of transformation through the character arc. Now these can be external changes or they can be internal changes. External changes are things like appearances. Um, did they grow old? Um, or in the case of Benjamin Button, did they grow young? Uh, or did they lose a limb? Uh, or did they get a scar of some kind? Or, or did something physical change them and, and change their physical appearance to do they now walk with a limp as a result of a car accident or something like that and then how they express themselves so a lot of times when people undergo um, a significant conflict or significant trauma they change the way they view the world and that changes the way they express themselves in relationship to the world and so you can you can sort of describe that and their economic status were they poor and now they're rich or were they rich and now they're poor so those are things that can, the kinds of conflicts that are going to change a character. Because rich people who are now poor are going to behave very differently than poor people who have always been poor. And poor people who become rich are going to behave very differently than rich people who have always been rich. 
So you want to take that into consideration. What kind of family and friends have, have changed? What, what has changed about their family status? What has changed with the friends that they have and the people that they associate with? Because as characters mature, you will associate, or you should, if you're a well-developed character, should associate with other people. You're not going to have the same friends throughout your life because you change and they change. And if you've kept the same friends, same circle of friends since you were a kid, none of you are growing. And that's not very human-like. So, un unless that's a point of the plot, which would be another interesting twist on a tale. And, and what kind of habits do they have? Have they, have they developed new things, a new quirk, a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things on a daily basis? Have they changed their habits as a result of this conflict that they've undergone? What kind of hobbies do they have? What do they do for fun? Or what have they stopped doing for fun? You know, what are the things that they used to love to do, but they don't do anymore because of this? You know, if you, for example, you could have somebody who is an avid fisherman, but part of the conflict was their child drowned while they were on a fishing trip, and so now they don't fish anymore. So that's another thing that you could, you could do. When I was a kid growing up in Canada, one of, my, um, one of my friends, her father drowned on a canoe trip. And a year later, I was at the site where he drowned and we were kind of stuck on this peninsula for five days and and they never recovered his body and there I was and and all I could think about was you know the kind of things that Sarah had undergone when when her dad Dave had, had drowned it, it it's a very profound thing and you think about those kinds of of you know how will that impact the the hobbies that they do I, I, I never quite enjoyed canoeing the same and the thrill of shooting rapids the same after after Sarah, my friend, when I underwent that experience. And, and that, that changed all of us. And, and what kind of tendencies do they have? What are the things that they used to do that they don't do, or, or the way they used to respond, but they don't respond that way anymore? They've matured in some way, shape, or form. They've grown up, or perhaps they're discovering their second or perhaps third youth, and, and they've regressed, and they're acting immaturely now as a result of this, this kind of conflict that's, that you've developed. And those are the external changes, but again, conflict changes the characters, not just on the outside, but it changes them on the inside. And the internal changes, which I alluded to when I was talking about um, the, the trauma that, that my friend Sarah underwent when her father drowned on, the, on that canoe trip in Canada, you, things like their mental health, um, the confidence levels that they have, or perhaps their anxiety levels or their stress levels, Perhaps their sexuality has been changed in some way, shape, or form. Or their opinions and beliefs about the way the world works has changed fundamentally because of this conflict. Their awareness of others. Um, they could either become more aware of others uh, or they become less aware of others. They become more insular, more, more inward-looking instead of outward-looking. Um, perhaps their compassion levels have changed. They've become less compassionate or they've become more compassionate. Their empathy for other people have, has, has been impacted in some way, shape, or form by that, that conflict. And, and so the character itself has changed. Perhaps their spirituality has changed. They've become more spiritual or less spiritual. Their mindset could change from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. Or perhaps their mindfulness levels have changed. They've become more aware of of their place in the world and, and their position in the world and what's going on in the world around them. And that leads to the biggest change of all is an increase in their level of self-awareness. Are they becoming more self-aware, uh, aware of their own strengths and more importantly their own weaknesses? Have they become more considerate of how they have an impact on other people and the choices that they have? have an impact on other people as a result of them interacting and responding and reacting to this kind of conflict that you've created them. See, I think Sid Field said it best. He said, without conflict, you have no character. Without character, you have no action. Without action, you have no story. So let me ask you this question. If you were a character, what would your story be? So. To answer that, you'd have to use these same kind of descriptors that you've, you know, these tips that we've given you for developing fictional characters to describe who you are now. So who are you now? And who would you like to become? And in that gap, 
between who you are now and who you'd like to become in that gap. What conflicts are you going to have to resolve in order to become who you want to be? What conflicts is that transformation going to require you to resolve? So I have some news for you. You are the protagonist in your own story of your own life. And you create your future through the choices that you make today. Just as you create characters for stories, you get to create your own character for your life story. And unfortunately, along with this, you create your own limitations through your perception of yourself. I think Jim Rohn probably said it most eloquently when he said, you can have more if you become more. If you like these tips on developing characters and developing your own character, please subscribe to the Skaldic Media YouTube channel.